Anyway, let me get going with the SU carburetors. SUs, um, SU stands for Skinner's Union. Skinner was a family. It's a family business, like Walt's Tire Shop. Okay, I mean Skinner. It's just a family name. As it turned out, a couple of the Skinner daughters campaigned MGs in the 1930s. But Morris purchased SU from the family in 1925, so it, it became it became part of of um, Morris's empire. The same year as MG did. If you adopt 1925 as the first MG, and of course that's been dialed back now um, to, to 2023, so this is the centennial year of of MG. Um, but in in the in the old calendar, uh, uh, MGs began at the same time that that uh, Morris acquired SU carburetors. So SUs are just the simplest, easiest carburetors. Oh my gosh, they're great. And the ones that we deal with, the three different SUs that we deal with, um, I could push it if we're talking about Farina magnets. Who's ever seen a Farina magnet unless you live in San Diego? Um, um, anyway, the Farina magnets use HD carburetors. But the, the first carburetor that we see af after the war, before the war, is the H type carburetor. That's a horizontal H, it's just called an H carburetor. Then beginning in 1962, um, the body of the carburetor was shortened up. And th so this is called an HS carburetor. This is from a midget, um, the HS carburetor. And this, this guy, um, maybe I'm gonna get rid of my screen for right now, my back screen so that this stuff shows up. Just a moment. So I got my real crappy green screen, but at least you can see it now. So here's the here's the uh, um, the short body, mean, meaning that the distance from the mounting flange to the air cleaner flange is is uh, is shorter than the H type carburetor, which is which is considerably longer. Um, the HS carburetor has a jet on the bottom here that is connected. Uh, connected to the to the float bowl with a external pipe and a gland nut. The H type carburetor uses uses some internal drillings to get the gasoline from the float bowl to the jet, um, and then the jet itself slides up and down through a bath of of gasoline. And there's some seals in there that, if they're in good shape, will keep it from dripping. But this this one this one until the until this line snaps cracks which is rare very very rare doesn't doesn't leak they ran this from about 1962 through um, 1972 71 excuse me and then in 72 they came out with the HIS carburetor which is called a horizontal horizontal integral float, the float bowl on the bottom, rather than the float bowl on, on the side. And if you have the choice, if you're, if you got a more modern MG and you want to put carburetors on it, always choose this one with the, with the float bowl on the side, because if there's anything that goes wrong with it, you can fix it in place. This guy, anything that goes wrong with it, you've got to take it off the car. I'm going to set a HIS off of 74 MGB really quickly, but you've got this bolt down down here at the at the bottom um, that attaches to to the manifold. This bolt here, and it's it's way up in there. And unless you're used to doing it, it's a real bugger, a real bugger to to get out. But what I want to talk about today is adjusting the carburetor. So all, if you have one carburetor, it's just a slam dunk. But if you got two, and most of us have two. The first thing that you have to do is make sure that each carburetor is drafting the same amount of air. Okay, so that means that the throttle disc, the throttle disc is, is open the same amount on each carburetor, and you judge that by either listening down the down the the throat here with a tube up your ear and listening to the 
sound, or you can buy a Unisyn to put that on, on here with a little ball that moves up, up and down. That's pretty handy. Um, and um, the, first, the first job is to get both carburetors drafting the same amount of air. That's not number one. Number two, you want to get the carburetor with the correct richness. Now, there's a piston lifting pin here um, on this carburetor right here, and that will lift the air piston up and down. You can see the air piston jump up and down. But eh, when you're doing it by hand, when you're doing it on a tune-up, it's, it's hard sometimes to judge when this hits the piston. And what I prefer to do is to take a screwdriver, put it down the throat, turn the screwdriver just slightly, just a flat bladed screwdriver, turn it and just turn it, just, just barely, barely, barely lift that air piston. And as you lift the air piston, the mixture leans out. Our car's idle rich. So if you lean out the mixture, it's gonna run a little bit better because it's gonna run a little more efficiently. So when you put your screwdriver down underneath there, you can't use your finger because it distorts the air airflow. And I'm, I'm suggesting you don't use the piston lifting pin because it's hard to get that little tiny incremental rise in the, in the air piston. Just put a screwdriver down, down the throat. If the air cleaners are on, obviously you can't do that. Um, and just turn that screwdriver a, a tiny little bit and disturb the, the position of the air piston. One of three things is gonna happen. Either the RPMs are going to go up, up, up as it as it climbs in in uh, um, in speed because it's already too rich, and by lifting that air piston, you're leaning it out, so it so it ends up being um, um, leaner and runs better. Um, or um, or you. Um, you may have the, the situation where you lift the air piston ever so slightly and the RPMs stumble and fall right, right off. They just fall off. You know, it's, it's running, but as soon as you begin to disturb the position of the air piston, it falls away, means it's too lean already, okay? And what you're looking for in the end is, is, is you just begin to touch that air piston. You want the RPMs to rise just a little bit and then fall away. Just 50 or, uh, 50, or 75 R, uh, uh, 50 or 75 RPM. If you've got a moving coil tachometer um, with a needle, you can't do a digital on this stuff. It just looks like, a, it looks like you're looking at a, a scrolling uh, gasoline pump. Um, but if you've got a needle, you, you can see the needle just deflect, just deflect. So is, is this piston, is this jet rather, is this jet, comes down, can I make it come down? Yeah, there, as that jet comes down, you can see I'm working the choke here, but as that piston comes, that jet comes down, it makes it rich because it's pulling, it's pulling the hole, which is the jet, um, away from, away from the, the, the needle. So, um, in the making the annulus, the effective area that the that the gasoline is mixing, it's making it uh, making it larger. So, just remember that as you adjust this adjuster nut at the bottom down down, it makes it rich. So, let's say you get the airflow; it's it's, uh, there's, it's drafting the same. Both carburetors are drafting the same amount of air. It's idling. You've set it so it's. Now it's idling around 850 RPM, and you start to adjust the mixture, and the RPM climbs up to 1200 RPM. Well, now you get to set the idle back down, so it's back around 850 or so, and you keep working between the between the throttle screws, moving them evenly, and the mixture back and forth until each carburetor acts like it's supposed to, and the RPM just rises. In the case of an HIF carburetor, once you achieve that that part that that position where the um, the RPM just rises and then falls away, you want to give it an extra quarter. You adjust it through here on the HIF. You want to give it an extra quarter or half 
clockwise turn, which is rich. Then you got to deal with fast idle. So down here, you can see that that I've got this is the throttle, this is the throttle, but the the uh, the choke over here has a cam, and as that cam begins to turn, it'll also turn the throttle. And you want both carburetors to draft the same amount of air when it's on fast idle. So if you're just doing it by yourself, maybe you go inside the car and you pull the choke out until it's running the fastest. What's it running at? 900, 3000, whatever. Adjust it until it's running the fastest, then go back around to the carburetors with your unison or your listening tube and set each carburetor so that the draft is the same, the amount of air going through them is the same, and it's idling around 1600 RPM. Then you can shut it off. Now there's an interconnecting link that goes from, from uh, the, the throttle on one, this is the MGB, the MGC, later midgets. Um, there's an interconnecting link and that link has got a little, uh, uh, little finger in it. And you've got to adjust those fingers so that when you open, open the throttle, that both carburetors begin to open at the same time. Here you've taken all this time to adjust everything and get it perfect. You don't want to have it adjusted so that one carburetor opens before the other one does. So it's a straightforward, as long as everything else is set up. That's that's a big if. You know, emissions as great or slight as they are, engine, ignition. And finally, we're around and you check the, the fuel delivery and you clean the inside of the carburetors, then adjusting them is pretty fast. So get the airflow the same, correct the mixture, get the fast idle at 1600, shut it off and adjust the interconnecting link so the carburetors open at the same time. It's as easy as that. It's just not, it's not I, I, easy for me to say. Um, but it's it's not as complicated as some people would have you believe. And just because your car runs bad doesn't mean it's the carburetors, which everybody thinks is the case, but it's not. So underneath the, underneath the, uh, the damper up here on top, I want you to use as thick oil as you can get. 9140 if you've got a TC and you get some of that around. 8090 hypoid gear oil if you've got that around. Use the thickest oil that, that you can. That's the that's the the best that you you can do. That is a all carburetors have to have an accelerator pump. Well, no, they don't. Ours don't. All carburetors have to enrich the mixture dramatically at acceleration. So most carburetors have got an accelerator pump. Now a diaphragm, a diaphragm that when you when you press on the on the throttle to the floor, that diaphragm deflects and pushes just this enormous amount of raw gasoline into the intake um, so that you're rich enough when you want to accelerate. We don't have an accelerator pump. Therefore, pumping the throttle on your carburetors doesn't do a thing, not, not with an SU. Um, so the mixture is enriched at acceleration by the resistance of the air, of the air piston to rise this air piston inside here um, wants wants to rise. The, the faster the, the air goes, that that air piston rises. It follows airflow, and the the thicker the oil you got up on top, the longer it takes that piston to come up to what's supposed to be the correct position for any speed. And by taking longer, I mean it it takes a second and a half instead of half a second, something like that, to, to rise up there. During that time, the Venturi is held artificially small, and the, the uh, mixture, therefore, is going to be a whole lot greater uh, because the, the vacuum at the jet is going to be greater. It's going to suck more gasoline out of the jet because the air is going faster across the, across the Venturi. So that's about it. Everything should be lubed, oiled, 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 oiled. This all this linkage uh, on the side that that runs the runs the uh, runs the the jet, so that when you when you operate the 
hard for me to do here. This is not, I've, I've got to get a better camera. Um, to get this uh, jet to drop here, um, that snaps up pretty well, but all this linkage in here, just oil it, oil, 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 make it, make it drip. Everything works better with oil on it, for sure. So anyway, hey, yeah. yes. Uh, this is Judd. You were holding that up a minute ago, and you turned the uh, enriching uh, nut, I guess you call it, and nah, this is going to be a stupid question, but everybody says, turn it clockwise for this and counterclockwise for that. And what I don't know, is that clockwise, look, it, yeah, is clockwise you, looking up? You're looking up or you're looking down. <laughs> so, yeah, that's what I want to so, know. Un unscrew it to make it rich. Unscrew it to make it rich. Move it down. Un okay. Unscrew it to make it now, rich. Does the, does the nut move or does only the jet thingy move? The, the nut. Shice. Uh, the the nut moves. I I don't think I can. You probably I can't probably show you here, but this this nut. I'm screwing. I'm unscrewing it right now. Um, that's making it go richer. That's that's pushing the jet down. The farther the jet goes down, the richer it is, right? Because because if you want to start it, you know you you drop the jet way down, and and if the, if your car won't start. <laughs> these are all these other bizarre problems, but if your car doesn't want to start, it, it's ram, ram, ring, and then you start try it again and again and again. It's because these jets aren't dropping far enough. If you drop that jet far enough, um, you know, I mean, look at how far that's dropped, and that's that's pretty good. Sometimes they drop half an inch, you know, and if you drop it that far, it'll start just like that. Oh my gosh, it'll start just in a jiff. So as long as the jet has dropped far enough. Hey, John, can yes, I sir. Uh, offer something? Yes. I uh, just got my carbs rebuilt by Joe Curto and sure. uh, did a wonderful job. And mm -hmm. I got him on my A yesterday and got things going on it. But I ran into a snag and just want to share with other people. The adjustment screw for the choke was out was 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 further down than it should have been and when i was trying to adjust the carburetors it was interfering with the adjustment because it was enriching the mixture on the front carburetor these are hs carburetors h4s h4s in the adjuster screw which right next to the throttle adjustment screw is a, is a screw that adjusts for the uh the choke mm -hmm. and so yeah. it enriches the uh, fuel mixture on the front carburetor, uh, if it's down and making contact, it's a, it's it, it needs to be okay. pulled out basically. And since I didn't do that, it caused some issues trying to get the front carburetor to balance. Okay, okay. So you're you got t, a t set of T type carburetors? No, they're they're SU4 H4s for a 57 MG 1500. Okay, all right. Okay, but the, but the choke is on the front carb, and if the screw is too tight, it, it activates the cam too soon. Exactly, and so the, the I was I, I couldn't get it to run right until I figured out why, because it wasn't the riching adjustment screw on the bottom that you're showing, uh, the the nut. It was actually the screw that was causing me the problem. Okay, so on an MGA, there is a cam there that has three positions: one, two, three. Um, Fred, I, I I heard your voice on here. What I can't remember what when you go all the way one way. Oh my gosh, the RPMs climb way up before that starts starts enriching the mixture, and uh, and the uh, the other end of that cam, either one or three, um, doesn't do it quite so much. Almost all of them are set at number two, but there are conditions where you want you want um, that cam put in a, a different place. I don't have an H type carburetor here, but um, when you pull the choke cable out of the dash by uh, the first third of its movement, all it does is increase the RPM. All it does is increase the RPM. The second two thirds of movement actually drops the jets and enriches mm -hmm. the mixture. 
Um, and so that's the that's what I'm talking about getting that 1600 RPM right when you pull it out and just hit the max on the on the uh, speed of the of the car uh, of the of the idle you're looking for 1600 RPM but yeah you want to back all the all the adjuster screws off before you get going just just to make sure nothing's in the way there there's other bizarre stuff I mean there's just there's no end of the craziness that, that can happen. On the um, 68, 68 through 80, there's um, you can see this. Uh, I, uh, yeah, well, I, I got rid of my hair. Let me go back to my, my green screen. Um, you, you can see this valve, the spring-loaded valve on the, on the throttle disc. So that's 1968 through 1980, and that that pulls open uh, during deceleration, so you the car can't slow down too fast. Sometimes those will come loose and cause the cause the car to, to idle really high. You no, know, you back off all the idle screws, everything still idling real high. It's because that that valve is is uh, pulling open. There's a bunch of uh, unusual things that can happen. Here's the Smith's PCV valve. Um, this is a, a complicated device compared to American PCV valves. Um, there's a one-way valve down inside here. And then there's a spring. The spring goes in on, on top. And then, uh, then there's a plate, a little plate. And then there's the rubber diaphragm. So whenever you buy one of these, buy two, Carry it with you because you can't get one at Walmart. You could use a plastic glove if you had to, but if this if this gets too stiff or cracks, if it cracks, all of a sudden you can start uh, sucking an enormous amount of oil into the intake manifold. Um, but this is this valve is only used from 1964 through 1968. 1969 they changed the ventilation. Um, but there's all kinds, that's, that's why I said I just want to talk about the adjusting the carburetors. Because um, once everything else is all taken care of, the valve's good, the, that valve doesn't leak. I mean, there's, there's cool stuff like this, these old brass pistons. And I've talked to people before, these are for the real early cars. Um, they, it was just cheaper to make them in brass at the time. Um, but then people were are will look in the in the catalog and they say, well, I haven't got a spring on my piston, so they put a spring on top of this. Now it's got double double the weight or double the downward force that it should, and the car always runs rich. So the brass piston, there are no there are no springs. Um, there's all the little tiny tiny things here on on rebuilding carburetors. So. Um, Fred was on before talking about, about the numbers on the carburetors, the numbers that are stamped up at the very, the very top. You can't see that one, but there's, there's, you can see the little hash marks up, up here. There's some numbers up there. Fred's got a, a decoder. When was that, Fred, that you, you were on? That was last spring or sometime? Um, yeah, a couple of years ago. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's all kinds of, all kinds of stuff. All kinds of stuff to to uh, imagine and look at. Um, you can get the pistons mixed up, one carburetor from the other, and then the the air holes are not in the right place. Um, here, here we've got a. You can see the air holes in the bottom of this, and the air holes are on the lee side of the of the airflow. So the air is coming up through here. The engines at the top of the picture, um, and uh, those air holes transfer the vacuum behind the air piston up into above the top of the piston so that the piston is drawn up. Oh, that one's jammed up. So it's drawn in, into the, uh, drawn up into the suction chamber. These have got a lot bigger holes. This, this is an M MGB. Um, and, uh, here we've got a slot in here. This is all emission stuff, um, but it's, it's uh, you can you can mix and match and get the wrong you can get the wrong piston with the wrong 
carburetor, you can get the wrong suction chamber with the wrong piston. Oh my gosh, uh, all kinds of all kinds of possibilities here. But if everything else is all right, airflow mixture, fast idle, interconnecting link. So it's all straightforward. Anyway, I'm I'm here to answer some <clears throat> more questions about uh, John. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's Fred from uh, Paris in France. Yes. I have, I have a question. When you say about um, uh, reach or lean, uh, you have to uh, push a little up the, the piston. And when you have the correct uh, RPM, that means a little, a, a little bump and after uh, steady, you, you, you say, and then you add a quarter turn on the rich screw, but you mean a quarter turn, you 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 add more you, rich or more, more rich, richer, yes. And that's only the HIF. That's the yes. HIF, not the other ones. Um, yes, the HIF one. is adjusted here on the side. Clockwise is rich. And that's because there's a bimetal strip in there. I never did this, but I've heard so many people tell me, oh my gosh, after you get done adjusting them, you absolutely have to, you have to, you know, give it another quarter or half a turn so that it continues to run correctly, no matter what the temperature. So okay. I've, I've adopted that. Thanks. You're welcome. John. <clears throat> yes. Um, the um, uh, you're explaining with an uh, an HS4 uh, when the choke isn't working enough. How about with the uh, HIF? I've got a problem there. Doesn't seem to be choking. That is the reverse problem that everybody else in the world has. <laughs> Jeez. If anything that goes wrong with this carburetor, the HIF, anything that goes yeah. wrong with this. It's because it's too it's too rich. It's never because it's too lean. But you know that the 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 choke is controlled here on the side by the rotary choke, and it's uh -huh. a, you know there is no choke. A choke is this, right? You know, <laughs> a choke is this, and it's not a choke. It, it's a mixture control. But um, I you know there's a number thirteen O ring in here, and this uh, the gasoline burbles up through a a hole inside inside the throat. Um, and and uh, I have no idea why why it's it wouldn't be. I mean, you want to make sure that the that interconnecting link is yes, it is turning all the way it possibly can. But I have I have no answer for too lean of a of a startup on an HIF. I don't because the car runs great the rest of the time, but the first cold start in the morning it's a, it's a, a real labor. <laughs> I think it's got a very strange cabling system. Uh, when I put the uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. H carburetors and replace my HIFs, the, the cable kind of goes up a big arc and comes back down into a fixed place, and it almost operates in reverse of what you would think. So yes. you might check the, cable, the, the cabling to see, make sure it's connected correctly. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's really counterintuitive because the, the inner cable is fixed. You're yeah. right, and it's the outer cable that moves. So you just look at That's this weird. and go, wait, what's this? But there are other cars, Morgans, I think I worked on a Morgan once, where the throttle cable also worked like that. What makes the gas? I'm gonna, I'm gonna hit the mute all here, just, just. Uh, so I'm looking to see. There, mute all, there we go. I'm sorry, I had to mute everybody because there's some background noise. Um, um yeah well just you know just you pull the choke all the way out and then and then actually reach reach in there with your thumbs and just make sure that 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 is is moved um that's rotated all the way but i can't imagine why else it would be a problem um there you you could you could experiment a little bit on this hif carburetor if the uh, the vent for the float bowl is is here, so the the, the lower the lower of the two, this is the in in and out on both both sides here, and this guy here is the vent. 
So if you if you put a hose on this and take the suction chamber and and, and spring an air piston out and you put a, a little hose on that and puff into that hose, oh my gosh, you'll get a column of gasoline under just a, a light puff that'll go up three foot in the air. Just, I mean, it's just it's incredible. So now, now instead of doing that, pull your choke all the way on inside the car, put your finger then on the main jet and blow into that um, hose and see the gasoline burbling up out of the, of the hole to the rear of the main jet is to the rear and offset. And then match one with the other. Maybe one of them isn't carrying any fuel. And it's just got, just one of them's carrying fuel. And at least, I don't know what the problem would be, but at least you would then identify it to one, one carburetor in, instead of, instead of uh, uh, it, it being a, a, a mystery. So um, let me just see if I can get the top of this guy off. These are the carburetors that I, so here, here are the three holes down inside here. So the one immediately to the rear of the main jet, which is above in my, in my picture here, that's the emulsion tube, that's some emission stuff. But the other hole, which is located uh, on my screen to the upper left, that's the one through which the gasoline passes uh, to enrich the mixture. And it's hard to see with the, the light source that I have here, but anyway, there there is, there is another hole in there. And if you just put that that tube on here and then and then blow into it with your finger on the on the main jet through the through the front, um, it it's, it 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 comes up like a like a, a real low pressure artesian well. I mean, it just it burbles burbles up out of there. So I try one, try try the other. An idea. Uh, John? Yes. Hi, this is Walter in uh, Southern California. Do you have any way of testing the bimetal? Um, I don't no. know what it's called. No. Jet holder? No. No. I don't know how much that deflects. I've never measured it. Um, Fred, you, you ever done that? You ever you ever put, put something in a pan of water and and uh, heated it up to see how, how much how much D deflection that makes ne never tested them i just assume they work <laughs> so yeah so i, uh, I don't I know have, yes uh about the hf4 carb yes there is a sort of uh, a spring made of a b, b uh, metal uh, because uh, temperature uh, influence the opening of the of, of the jet yes okay so to 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 start the the, the tuning of uh, the, rich, the to be rich or lean, you have to put the the top of the of the jet just flush to the hole in the center. Yes, Ruff, roughly it is two two turn from uh, the stop. Roughly, and after you adjust from these two turn, if you have to screw in or screw out. To, to adapt your uh, the, the good RPM and to have, uh, as you said, a little bump in the RPM and then come back to a steady. Yes. I, I it never doesn't, measure, measure, I it doesn't quite measure um, the, the, the spring. As long as uh, you check it uh, when it is fully open, that uh, when you screw in, for example, you, you push up the, the jet in the car. So when you when you screw when you screw the screw in, it drops the jet because um, it makes it rich. Clock, clockwise is rich. Uh, yes, you are yes. right. If you yes. screw in, it is more rich, so right. you go down. Sorry, right. You're, you're... That's okay. It's all right. Yeah. So I always start those right right at the. Um, I don't start them flush. I always start them maybe two. Maybe you said that two turns. Um, maybe. Two, two turns below flush, but then right away, as soon as it starts, you can start fiddling with the mixture. And because and, because uh, I have I have a document coming coming from the a, SU carb from from England, mm -hmm. in which they explain for each carb uh, how to do the tuning the correct tuning 
and and they they explain you put a a, a rule a, a steel rule to see if you are fully fully flush perfectly flush and after you adapt uh, the richest because if you don't start uh, flush and then you do you you uh, you screw two turns you cannot start you need to do your two turns and after you can start okay the um the bimetal strips i had an issue with um uh, finding them for quite a while um i had to um uh, had some pinging problems that wouldn't i couldn't clear up and um you know i started measuring the jet height um and you know uh, setting the jet height by uh with a pair of calipers and every time i went in there they were in a different place um and yeah. i always check them I always check them cold so i put a new pair of them in and the problem is gone interesting so there is a problem with those okay there can be yes well okay that's what i meant to say um so that's 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 something that's something for th those of us who are who are like are really really intense on this to to put them in you know to to take them from from zero to one hundred or from thirty two to two twelve depending on which system you're in and just see what happens and just see how much deflection there, there there is that's interesting once they're off the carbs they're really difficult to uh, index I, um, yeah yeah absolutely I mean how how would you do it you know, yeah. so yeah, yeah, you um, gotta have. Also, another point on the HIFs, um, the needle is quite quite a bit recessed into the piston. Yeah. So setting it flush is probably pretty close. I mean, I think I'm running um, uh, five or eight thousandths below um, below uh, the bridge. So this is this is the this is the needle, and you can. I don't think you can see here, but this the shoulder of this needle, the shoulder of the needle should be at the shoulder of the depression of the slot. This is just ex this is almost exactly correct. So the, the shoulder of the needle should be at the base of this slot that, that runs along here. Some of the later ones, you don't have any option. It's always correct. Um, but some of the earlier ones, you can move them up and up and down. So you want to make sure you get them in the in the right in the right place, and also that they have to be biased correctly. Uh, the spring is missing out of here. This just flops around, but but they're they're biased towards the airflow. Um, so I mean they're they're biased biased towards the towards the engine. So yeah, they, there's a there's a bunch of stuff on those HIFs that's quite different from the earlier carburetors. Yeah, I actually prefer the HIF. I know uh, you like the separate float, float bowls, but uh, it's just, if there's to a me, problem, it's more particular. If there's a problem with the float, if there is, carburetor comes off the car. If there's a problem with the float on an HS or an H type, you can fix it right there. So that's, that's why. They, that, they I, I agree there, but the uh, okay. I find the uh, HIF in general is more reliable. Um, I have less less of a need to go in there. Okay, that's cool. So, yeah, thank you. I uh, hope to see you when you're in California. Yeah, I'll be in uh, LA. My daughter lives uh, at the base of Griffith Park, but uh, I'll 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 send a note out uh, before I go out. So cool. Okay, great. That gives you the, the southern. The Southern California MG Club is having its meeting on the 15th of October. Um, and and I, I've got a fa family obligation that day, so I, I, I've got to be here. Otherwise, I, I would be there and visit my daughter at the same time. Hey, John, I've got a couple of questions on the HIF floors. Yes, sir. OK. Uh, can I speak? I am Fred. Can I speak? Yeah, you can go ahead. Sure. Yeah, uh, I sent a message. I don't know if you see it or if I don't know if everybody can see it. I sent uh, the U.S. document from uh, SU Carb uh, from uh, UK, uh, and uh, on on this uh, website you have all the type of SU uh, carburetors and the various uh, 
uh, tuning um, methods. Yes, thank Fred, you. it's on there and we can see it. Thank okay, you. thank you. Thank you. And then somebody else had a question about uh, HIFs. You're on mute, Mark. What's that? Oh. Huh? There we go. Okay. Okay. Somebody, someone told me that when using the Unisync tool, that I needed to disconnect the linkage between the two carburetors. I, but I watched your video. You never did that. No, you, you can. You can have a situation where the little fingers are so wrong that you know if you're trying to increase or decrease the idle speed, you get no change because the fingers in the way. But that that's usually not a problem. I mean, it, it, if it turns out to be, you can have the you can have the idle screw um, down too far too. Um, this okay. The screw here um, that that right. could be down too far, and of course that would then limit your your ability to to change the idle speed. But um, yeah. It, okay. The other question I've got, John, is. I I never understood that when adjusting the the uh, the actual mixture on those carburetors that the that the uh, RPM would rise about 50 RPM and I never understood that I guess it will fall after that. How far does it fall? Does it fall like it stumbles if it's yeah, too yeah because it's it's because it's too lean. Yeah, the the they they want to idle rich. But as right. soon as you make them a little too lean, but I mean, you don't you don't have to but touch that air piston. I mean, the workshop manual says move it. I don't know five three sixty fourths of an inch. The engine's doing this. Are you kidding me? You can't measure anything like that. You just barely touch it. And and if you want to get a gross um, check on it, just lift it up. Just move move it up a quarter of an inch. You know, I mean that that'll tell you if it's too rich. Because it'll keep the RPM will keep going up, up, up. But just just as you touch it, it should just rise and then and then it falls away. Because it's too lean. It doesn't want to run there. Thank you, John. Okay. Yes, um, John. I have yes. I have another question. Um, a lot of books said that uh, before you you adjust uh, your carburetor, you have to have a, a good tuning of, of of the engine itself. So what is and somebody told me that uh, on uh, when when you are on static, that means with a, a, a small lump, uh, you should have an advance of five degrees. And some people told me here in France that on uh, the old engine, they are a little worn everywhere, and uh, you have not to start with five, but perhaps with 15. So what is your recommendation in static and then with a, a lump? Well, if, if you get points, you can static time it. But the, the bottom line, the end result is that you want it at 32 degrees before top dead center, at full mechanical advance, vacuum disconnected. So if you rev it up to three or 4,000 RPM to okay. where the mechanical advance stops advancing, you should be at 32 degrees, not 31 and not 33, 32 degrees before top dead center. Three, two degrees? Thir 32. Okay. 32. So, Fine. Thank you. Um, so if you have a point style distributor and you've taken the distributor apart and you've looked down inside it in the, in the little cam, the limiting cam is stamped 12 degrees. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's half, that's half engine degrees. So that's really 24 degrees. So you double it, you take the 12 and it becomes 24 Subtract the 24 from 32, you get eight, and that's your static setting. Ah, okay. But you have to take the distributor apart and look at it to see what the, what the advance is. Because from, 19, from 1962 
through 1974 in the United States, the distributors um, advance anywhere from 10 degrees to 19 degrees. Well, a 19 degree advance, double that, you get 38. The, so that one you have to set it at minus six degrees static if it's a 19 degree distributor. So it depends on your distributor. And most of the most of the distributors that were um, supplied in the Europe in the European market and the British market um, are are 10 degree distributors. So that means that your static timing should be at eight. No, uh, no. If you tell me 10, 10, that means twice, twice oh, 10, 12, 20, 12, 20, 12, 20, 32 less 20, 12. that means 12. Okay. Two. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. The problem with setting the time in any other place, say you say, well, let's set it at 1500 RPM. You don't know where the advance comes up. You don't, you don't know how far, fast it's advancing. Is it advanced almost all the way? Is it just started to advance? Who knows? So the, the real way to do it is disconnect the vacuum, rev it up until it quits advancing, and, and you have to use a dial back timing light and set the timing at 32 degrees. And that's 1946, 1945, TC, through 1980 MGB, not V8, not twin cam, but mm -hmm. every other one. And for that matter, the Triumphs, the Triumphs and the Healy's also. So. Okay. Okay. Thank you. We have some more questions about carburetors, and then I'll because as soon as we're we're done with those, I'm going to get into the into the chat. John. Yes. You set yeah. the TC through. What about pre TC? You got it. That's an XPAG engine in yours, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, that's that's thirty two. Okay. I don't know what it is for an MPJG, but that's a TA engine. So yeah, but the TB is also thirty two max. Yeah, that's where I I, I would have set it on yours. And and um, uh, if you don't have a dial back timing light on a T-type, that 32 degrees is 1.004 inches ahead of the real timing mark. So you, in inches as close as you can get with a paint pencil, you know, so you just lay out an inch ahead and that's that's your maximum timing. But but most T-types, you can, you can set them static. You just ro roll them over to, to top dead center and just do it static. Because the, the advance on the inside of the distributor is 16 degrees, which means 32 on the crank. So. Uh, John? Yes. Uh, Jim Herbert here from Calgary. I'm running uh, on my B, I've got HS6s with Downton, uh, Downton Head and Downton Headers. And I've got it, I've got, I went through it, tuned it all up, the engine's fresh. And I get a surge from about 900 to about 1400 when it's idling hot. And I can't figure out why it's surging up and it falls back to about 900 and then it'll crawl back up to 12, 1400 and then drop back to 900. And I can't figure out what's causing it. Is it a pr pretty regular surge? Yes. It, okay. So I would, I would look for a vacuum leak, textbook case vacuum leak um, someplace. And it's just a little bit of a leak. So it, it adds just a little bit of air. So it runs better, 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 better. And then it's too lean. And then it falls back down. And then it repeats the cycle. So um, take a can, a, spray, a can of spray carburetor cleaner and, and just flush the area between the head and the manifold, the manifold and the heat shield, the heat shield and spacer blocks all around the carburetors. All carburetor shafts will leak a little bit. Um, but you're, you're looking for, for one that really, really changes the RPM. And is it going to speed it up or slow it down? It depends on how bad the leak is, how it's tuned, and what the carburetor cleaner is made out of. Um, but you use that, you know, if you've got that long straw on the front of the, on the carbs and spray it around there, if you find a vacuum leak, it's like, oh, there it is. 
because it either stalls it or speeds it way up. You got to take care of that. But that's my guess. If it's a if it's a regular, it's a rhythmic, periodic um, rise and fall. It's it's a vacuum leak. Oh, good because I just put a heat shield on it, so I had the carburetors off. I bet I've got a nut that's come loose on my carburetors. Oh, if the gasket could be torn. You could have a little tiny piece of shit on the carburetor gasket and a little tiny bit of air is going through there. And of course it doesn't make a whit of difference at, at 60 miles an hour, not zero. Yeah. I mean, it just not, not enough air goes in there to, to affect the mixture at all, but at idle, there's hardly a, hardly any air at all that's going through the, through the carburetors at idle. So. And it seems to do it. It's a, when it's warm for sure. Okay. Sometimes it whistles. Sometimes you can grab the carburetors and move them up and down and you can get it to change, or you can get a you get a on on a deceleration. You know when the when the intake manifold vacuum is real high, but I bet you'll find it. That was a real good show out there in Calgary. I, that was a lot of fun. That was really nice. Yeah, I couldn't believe you fixed that many cars here that day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. The the oh, I you know all I've forgotten all of them except the guy with that Harvest Gold seventy three BGT. That he had the air pump on. Everything was originally owned it for 30 or 40 years. And it all been exactly the same. And it all ran fine. He got there and went to wherever the club told him to go. And the guy there said, oh, you got to take all this stuff off. And he took it all off, which is, you don't have to. I, I shudder. And then he, <laughs> he left the air intake. And right in the center of the intake manifold, kind of open with this rubber plug in it. And it got this hole in it. And, and it... Yeah. So we fixed it with duct tape. That was the that was the humor from that day. Yeah, yeah I was I was standing there when you were doing that. Great. <clears throat> and, I, and I found the problem with carb cleaner, right? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thanks, John. This is Judd. One one quick observation before you go to the chat. This happened to two of our club members within the last six months, and I'd never seen it before. But all of a sudden, the car was running. Uh, their car was. Uh, jerk, I mean, very inconsistent. They couldn't get anything balanced out. They couldn't get it to run right. And it turns out in both cases, the little, uh, I call them an S clamp that connects the rod between the two carburetors had broken. But oh. when it was at idle, it was, they were in the right uh, adjacent to each other. You couldn't see the break. But it was, the causing the uh, yeah we're really basically running on one carburetor after that but we had it twice in less than six months and I'd never ever seen it before. Yep, there's there's I mean there's just stuff that happens. Yep, yeah, that's they they just don't run well on one carb. So yeah, yeah. Did you? I, uh, hey, hi, how'd you guys come out with your gearbox? Oh, it's not a gearbox. Glory was right. The the noise is coming from the rear in. Uh, Thought it, thought it was a differential, but it was the hub. Uh, the spline. The, the okay. splines in the hub. Stripped. Stripped. I've, and, ne uh, I've never heard of that before, ever. If I'd not, been there, I, I would have I recognized the noise, but oh but, my gosh. 15 years ago. and But I torqued this down 150 pounds. I, I just replaced the seal. I, I don't know what, why hey. it worked, but yeah. I'm looking at... Bruce Feldman's uh, film house in uh, Kalispell, Montana. He's the MGC uh, guy, and he's one of the guys you mentioned to me. And you had me call it uh, Bruce from the MG yeah. driver, right? And he and I got a few names, but uh, they right. told me a hundred miles to his house. He's got a guest house we're staying in, and uh, AAA did it for nothing. And a real nice guy that told us up there. Kind of strange, but it, <laughs> you know, isn't. But anyway. Uh, and we're waiting, we're for, waiting parts. for parts. That's it. Um, and we're waiting for a new axle. <laughs> so when, well, you get, they use, that's the other one, sports car craftsman. Uh, they're sending me all the parts, used axle, used hub, all that. And uh, and I told them that you're always uh, uh, giving them a shout out. You always, and uh, so he was appreciative of that. And, and so uh, everybody's been really nice. We're just waiting for delivery. Just sitting around. And it's been here. Uh, today, but it'll probably be here. They said tonight or tomorrow morning. But uh, and Bruce is um, this super nice guy. And plus, I'm getting you know. I think I talked to you about the the shims and the differential. Yeah. 
well, he's got the, he might as well put the shims in. I said, yeah, please, because I, <laughs> I don't know anything about differentials. So, yeah, yeah, please do yeah, that. Well, you're, you've already got one of the half shafts out, so that's all you, it's all you have to do. Take, take yeah. the re re recover off at this point. So, yeah, sure. Yeah. That's the might as well thing. <laughs> and there's a few guys around here that are car guys. We went and visited them, just not an MG guy, just car guys. They were interesting, but uh, Bruce has some interesting friends here, but he, I got to ride in his, uh, is uh, 69 uh, MGB and he's also got a 68 CGT, both really nice cars. So it was nice. Very nice, very nice. What I, what I want to mention to you is um, when the carburetor shafts, if they're leaking, somebody told me they did it. You get those little rubber rings mm -hmm. uh, and slide them down the shaft and it it's a temporary fix, but it seals the leak. It can. It can, yeah. yep. It's a lot cheaper, but it's only temporary. Uh, all those fixes are just temporary. You, you still got to, uh, fortunately, my shafts are just tight, and they, they seldom, and the HIFs, they seldom leak. Well, HIFs have got have AUD 3577, um, special, special O-ring that goes up against it, and they get sucked into place. So those, the, the, the HIF, the HIF seals are are great, are great. They're terribly. They used to be terribly expensive. I mean, now every, everything else, all the little gaskets and stuff, used to be you know in cents, and these things were like a couple bucks each. And of course, you needed four of them uh, for e either side of the shaft on the on the HIF. Today, I, they're probably not so expensive. But well, I, I get it. Not, not as good as the original ones either, but. I get all the carburetor stuff from either Joe Curto or or uh, Team Triumph because he does he sells Curto stuff yeah. and uh, Curto is the Curto is the carburetor king. Yeah, I, he's an honest guy because I called him up. I said I want to get a rebuild kit for my carburetors. And he said, "You really think you need it? It's one hundred and fifteen dollars." He said, "I just say the gasket kit for fifteen. <laughs> and he talked to me about a half an hour. I said, "What? Well, that's an honest guy." Appreciate yeah. him. Yeah, and anybody got, will talk himself uh, out of a out of a sale. Yep. So I got all these names from you, John, and I really appreciate it. Hey, yeah, well, you're stuck in Montana. It's the least I could do. Well, <laughs> well, but it's got a nice guest house here. Yeah, hey, giving... I, nice. Yeah, nice. <laughs> very, very you sweet. Stuff, but uh, anyway, I appreciate that. I don't want to take up any more time, but. Okay. I mentioned, I know you wanted to know. We took some pictures. We'll send you some pictures. <laughs> yep. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> Oh my gosh! Well, yeah. If I uh, oh well, hey, hey, if I if I ask you, does the speedo? Can you read, our, you know, like miles per hour on the speedo while it's making that noise? You would have said yes, and I would have said oh, and and but then Gloria had it sorted out too. It was, it was from the rear end, but you said there's all that oil underneath. Uh, oh well, anyway. Well, he said that carburetor. I mean, the carburetor, the uh, transmission <laughs> heating up. Because it, 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 we he looked in, it's not the oil's not coming from the engine, and yeah. he said if it, if it might come right out the top, and, and it's yeah. got a little. Oil. We'll we'll find out when we get it back together. No, we're we'll, just putting oil in it. But I, yeah, I should have listened to Gloria. <laughs> so it sounds, sounds like it's coming from the rear end, and I thought it feels like the transmission. So she was. Well, right. you still would have had to have it towed. So yeah. Anyway. Yeah. 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 Either. Yep. Yep. So thanks again. All right. That. All right. See you guys later. You let I'm you know the. Okay, I'm going to switch over to the uh, to the to the chat section um, right now, just because it's uh, it's eight o'clock and it's a two hour Zoom and we can push you know beyond that and everything. But um, anyway, we got Wayne in S L O uh, Saint Saint Louis. What's where's S L O? Any safe way to remove an oil pan on a TD that appears to be glued on with blue gasket cement? Um, Wayne, are you still on? I'm here. I'm in San Luis Obispo. Oh, all right. Okay. Well, I, you know, okay. Okay. All right. So um, um, anyway, what I would do, you know, you get, you get all the, all the external stuff off the, you know, all the, all the controls and all the, sure all the bolts are out. And then you go at it with a, with a, um, a big soft hammer. And just hit corner, 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 corner until something starts to move, and then rip the thing off. Um, so I, I don't, you know, like I don't have any other hints. I, you know, you could use a, um, 
paint scraper kind of thing to go between the block and the sump, but you just got to get it torn loose. When you put it back on, this is this is the trick. Uh, when you put it back on, there's a there's a piece of cork in the back that goes up, up above the above the uh, above the sump against the rear main cap. And you want to get that new piece of cork and wind it up in the direction it's supposed to be, and put a piece of tape around it and let it set for a day so it can it conforms and wants to wants to bend up rather than want, wanting to lie flat. So you've got that and use gasket goo on, on the bottom side of that arc and put that up into place. And then when you put the, put the gasket on, the, the new gasket on, adhere it to the bottom of the um, block with like ultra black or the right stuff, Permatex. But the bottom side of that gasket and the top side of the sump, just slather it with grease. Okay, grease is just fine. It'll seal it up just fine. And when you have to take it off again, it just drops off. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, Dean Hickey, hello from London. Dean, are you still on? Maybe it got too, too yep. late. There we go. Yep, I'm still here. Okay. Hey, great. So what, what year and model do you have? I have a 1980 Roadster MGB, Snapdragon Yellow. <laughs> I just saw one. I just saw one at the at the uh, uh, in Chicago at the at the big big car meet there. And I I looked I looked at it because I'm looking at it thinking oh in in, in Inca B and uh, and all of a sudden I'm looking at it, I go now I bet this is a 1980 and Snapdragon's just a little different that color they commonize that with a Triumph color. So it was exported to South Africa and then came back to England and then I bought it. Okay. But there's no rust on it, which is this saving grace. Very nice. Very, very nice indeed. Well, thanks. Thanks for being on. I worked at University Motors in Hanwell, West Seven. Yep. Uh, took the Piccadilly line out to Boston Manor, bought the yep. bus. Yeah, they were the biggest MG dealership in the world at the time. The time now, now it well, I mean. If life teaches you nothing else, it's that everything changes. But that yeah. that was then, 1972, 1973. Yeah. So, okay. Now I'm just wondering about changing the camber of the tires with wedges to lighten the steering. Is that a good idea or a bad idea? Because I've heard different things. Not the camber, the caster. Caster, excuse me. Caster. You got caster, camber, yep. and then towing, right? So if you do that, if you do that, because when you turn the steering wheel now, the nose of the car rises and falls as you go past center. It's you always almost got to see it, and that's why you know you're lifting the car by turning the wheel. Um, and you don't need to do that as much as you used to because we've got radial tires now, and that whole suspension was designed for bias fly tires. So if you do that and you put the wedges, which is a real bitch to do, because you got to drop the front coil springs out uh, so you can reach up inside there and get that front bolt. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a real, um, it's a real bugger to, to do. It's just time consuming. Um, you also have to reshim the rack and pinion. So you got to loosen up all four bolts that hold, hold the rack mm -hmm. and pinion in place. And I got a YouTube video up about how to do that really easily, but, but just keep that in mind. Be, otherwise, the 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 pinion is, is, is going to change change position. So well, I'm going to be pulling the engine out to do work on it, so I might as well do the front end at the same time while I get it out of there. And that's sure. Just trying to get my to do list sorted out. Well, yeah, absolutely. Okay, but it, it does lighten it significantly. Then that's what people say. Okay. I I I've never I've never done it for myself, nor have I done it for a customer. Okay. But, Good enough. Well, thank you very much for that answer. It's nice to be here. Hey, thanks a lot, Dean. So, Bill Weekly, are you still on from Ann Arbor? Bill, are you still there? I had a dump truck drag my midget twenty five feet across a parking lot before he before it dropped off his bumper. Nice, nice. That's almost, that's almost as good as my 
my F-350 versus my MGA. So Henry Lefevre from, uh, hello from Calgary. So good for you. Marty's got a note on here about uh, PayPal. Doug Miller, um, how do we find the monthly tech session videos? You go on to YouTube and type in John Twist MG. That'll do it. And then we've got or almost 400 videos. And the videos from about around 350 onwards, 370 onwards, are all the all the tech session videos. So just search YouTube for John Twist MG, and you'll you'll get there. Oh, Marty's got a got a a. Uh, a place there too. Um, Matt J, John, do you take Venmo? I just <laughs> I just canceled PayPal based on a, attempted identity theft. You know what I should do? Um, I should um, I should get a Venmo page. I really probably should. I really um, I thought you told me that you had one, but I just searched under all your. Ways I, and, I'll, I'll, I, my daughter pays me on yeah. Venmo for her phone, so I can only say that don't use the one that's called Uni University Motors because that's the car dealership down south or something. So that's not you. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, all right. Okay, thanks. Uh, Don Bueller, what are the signs that your SU needs a major rebuild or the need to buy new carburetors? First of all, don't buy new ones. Rebuild your old ones. They're better, they're cheaper. Less expensive, not cheaper. They're less expensive. What are the signs? Well, remember, I, I don't I don't have this in a in a handy little um um thing like I, I did with uh like an engine. You know, there are five factors that determine the condition of an engine. But there must be there must be some factors that 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 have to do with your with your uh, carburetor. If the shafts are loose in the body, of course you can just reshaft them, take them off and put new shafts in them. But God, if you're gonna do that, you might as well get new jets and new needles. How can you tell if the needles are worn? You can look at the needle. You can look at the needle, especially spring-loaded needle um, from uh, spring-loaded needle 1969 through 1980. And if you see a ridge on the needle, I mean the needle, the needle, here's an SU needle here, you know, but if, if you can see that that needle has a has an actual uh, divot in it where you can catch your fingernail or something up, up in it, it's really worn. Um, so, and... Um, uh, so what, what about the, where the, the jet goes up and down the, the, the column in there? What, what year are, are we uh, dealing 52. with? Yeah. Or T T D. Yeah. Those you can buy just the you can buy just the um uh the gland washers. There are a total of six that you need there. Yeah. Uh, and you just soak them in oil for 24 hours before you use them. And and don't even take the carburetors off the car, rebuild them right in place. There's no better vice to hold your carburetor bodies than than your engine. And they they don't go they don't flip around they don't go anywhere uh, and you can just put those those in and that'll take care of it real easily. You want to take your jet the outside of the jet and if you got a buffing wheel and buff it up and make it really really nice and smooth and slippery. But I, I if that's the only problem you got and that's gasoline dri dripping out of those jets, I'd go ahead and and um, just change the O rings. But, but you know, and I, I have done the O-rings and I've also done the Teflon rings and, and all that stuff. And uh the Teflons did stop some of the leaks, but uh, you know, the the cork ones they leaked really badly. So I started to think that maybe it was the the brass stuff that uh no, it's not that, but the the um there, there are two type. There are two types of of those cir those circular uh, cork rings. One's just plain old cork, and the other's graphite impregnated. So, yeah. if, if you always want to get your your gaskets from Joe Curto, he's got a website, okay. JoeCurto.com. Um, but if you soak those in oil and you and you buff up the 
you buff up the jet first so it's nice and smooth. They they just they don't leak. So I mean that's my experience. Okay. Thank you, John. You're welcome. Where where are you calling from? Um, Salt Lake. Oh yeah, all right. Out here in the desert. Yep. Yep. That Salt Lake's considerably smaller. It was since I was out there in 2017. Um, I, you, you, we had to drive on a little causeway over to the island where the An Antelope Island, something like that. Yeah, you can now actually go by land. I mean, it's the lake has receded so much, but it's come up a little bit. But you can go from island to island if you have an e-bike or something, and and uh, actually see some amazing, you know, things out there. I bet. I bet. Yeah, it's a beautiful place. Okay, Chip, uh, Eurekio, John, could you let us know yearly when it's time to make a contribution? Sure, sure. Be happy. Yeah, I, hi, John. I can never remember when I made a contribution. So, is there a way to let us know? <laughs> um, well, you can go back on your PayPal and you can, you can look there and see what it is. Some, pe some people um, put up a, a regular payment on PayPal. I mean, I got, I've got some people that, that pay me um, two, $2 a month. You know, I've got some other people that pay me a whole lot more per month just on a regular basis. So th that's what I do with Wikipedia. I think it's, I think I, I give them five, five bucks a month. Give me more than two, but um <laughs> Um, but I, Wikipedia, I, that's just a, uh, just a, uh, uh, some sort of instruction I made with PayPal to, to pay them on a regular basis, five, five bucks a month. I use Wikipedia all the time. So, okay. It was the easiest thing. I had the same problem and I just divided it by 12 and told PayPal to do it every month. Yep. Okay. Okay. From Scott Tant. Please say again the oil type for the SU. So the oil that goes in the top of the SU, the oil that goes up in here, the workshop manual says use. Oh, and I was talking. Yeah. Oh, I was talking to him. Oh, okay. Good. That's what my mute all buttons for. Um, <laughs> um, the workshop manual says use engine oil, right? Use engine oil, but this is a. This is a brass. This is a brass valve. It's a it's a valve, and this is a steel uh, uh, a steel cylinder. So when there's oil in here, and and of course this doesn't go up and down. The piston goes up and down. It abrates the inside of the steel because dirt gets caught on this brass and scratches the inside of here. It scratches the inside of the cylinder. Therefore, the inside diameter over a period of time becomes larger. So the cheap trick to take care of that is to use thicker oil. So the workshop manual says use engine oil, 2050. I use 8090 gear oil. Now, Glenn was on from Glenn's MG service in Tampa. He would remind me again that the viscosity of 8090 gear oil and 2050 is the same because they use different viscosity standards. But feel it. Look at it. It's thicker. I, I swear it's thicker. Um, never tested it myself. I should do that some, someday. Or use 9140, but you want to use thick oil in there. Not three-in-one oil, not ATF, not brake fluid. We saw that one time. Um, so anyway, and how to, how to check the oil levels? How is there too much or too little? Just generally speaking, on an SU, you never have to fill it. It, once you've got it in there, it doesn't go anywhere. But when you push this this piston down in here, as long as you can feel a restriction uh, from the oil just before the threads start, that's plenty. If you overfill it, and all you have to do is fill it right up to, to the top, the excess just pisses out and oils the uh, lubrication or uh, lubricates the, the linkage Unless you got a real early, um, real early H type carburetor, a dustless carburetor on an MGA, and then it gets sucked into the airflow. So you don't ever have to check the oil if you if you think it's too too low. Just um, um, 
um, just fill it, just just put put more more into it. So oh, let's see, I just missed where I was going. Just a minute here. I lost my place on the chat section. Um, uh, just a minute here. Just a minute. Here we are. Oh my gosh, come on. I somehow I got to the end rather than to the beginning. Summer party. I'm back to here. Come on. Here we go. Here we go. Got it. Got it. I'm back to let's see. Can you oh no, can you discuss changing the needle? The needle in the carburetor. Sure. How often should you do it? As soon as you see that there's some wear on the needle, or if the car's been unused. You, of course, can't see the needle very, very well here. But um, um, if the car has been unused and the um, and the gasoline has eaten away, well, it's in the gas, it's the, it's the uh, alcohol, is eaten away at the needle or the needle looks like a roof of the European cathedral, um, then it's time to change the needle. But the only thing you have to do is make sure the shoulder of the needle is in the right place. On these carburetors, the shoulder of the needle is, is, is in line with this dip, but with the earlier needles, this, this needle, the, the, shoulder, the shoulder of the needle, where it jumps up to an eighth of an inch, is flush with the bottom of the carburetor. So it's as easy as that. The spring-loaded carburetors, um, the uh, 69 through 74, spring-loaded needles, you, you, can't, you cannot make an error and, and get it loaded the, the wrong way. There's a chamfer in the side of the barrel. Hey, John? Yes. What's that little brass thing that's on the, the, the pump there? I mean, on the, that you just showed us, there's a little brass plug there? Well, we got- Yeah, that one. We got the needle, that's the needle. And we turn it around, and that's the grub screw that uh -huh. holds, holds the needle in place. And then on the underside, there's this little thing up here, which on the later carburetors is plastic, this little round thing here. And that holds the, holds the air piston above the bridge. I mean, incrementally, like a 164th, 1 128th of an inch or something, just barely holds it holds it up up off the up off the off the bridge. So those are the only brass things that there are in them. Unless you're talking about this, and of course that's the that's the damper. That's the no, damper. I was talking about the one previous to the damper. That that little brass plug there is uh they I see those on the bottom. Oh on the bottom, yeah. That's yeah. That, that that's that is to hold the piston above the bridge. So air can begin to go through there. Do they wear out? No. Okay. No. Um, e e even if you get excited and buff the pistons and make them look real nice, where's my brass piston? Um, even this guy, you can see that there's that the the raised the raised dot. Right yeah. There. As long as there's something there, there's it's good enough. Okay. Uh, Dean Hickey, change entire camber. We already answered that. Um, and Doug Miller's got a note from Marty. Um, and Meisel says, I'm just pleased as punch to be a member of your secret society. We've got even a more secret one coming up as soon as Marty and I can get it sorted out. Um, and uh, Marty's got some answers here. Uh, Bill Rosevere, at your summer party this year, there was someone whose rear engine block freeze plug had come out. Can you go over um, the detail of the quick fix for this? The size of the rubber plug? The size of the bolt, etc. So there are four freeze plugs or core plugs on an MGB or an MGA engine. Three of them run down the right hand side above the generator, um, uh, above the oil filter and the distributor, 
and one comes in from the back. These are where the, the sand casting was supported so that when the when the engine block was cast, the inside of the the inside of the engine block remained hollow. Um, so those are machined, and you've got these hemispherical plugs that are put into there and then squished. And when they're squished, they they uh, they jam out and jam up against the the uh, the base the base of the hole that's been been very carefully cut on the outside and they have to be installed dry. Sometimes you see them installed with some kind of gasket compound underneath underneath the, the, the plug. Sometimes they're called core plugs or freeze plugs or Welsh plugs, W-E-L-C-H, after, after a guy named Welsh. Um, so you don't put anything in there. You put them in dry, absolutely. And when you're building an engine, um, you put them in dry, machine shop if they put put them in that's fine if you put them in you you've got to you've got to take that hemisphere and and almost and make it all but flat and as you go a little too far then it begins to to go concave on the outside so don't go quite that far then take um jb weld and put it around the circumference of the outside and JB Weld is real plastic. It, it moves, it runs. So um, when you're building an engine and you're putting the freeze plugs in, you support the engine so it's horizontal and then and put this JB Weld on the outside of it. And, and if it goops up a little bit or looks kind of crappy, you can sand it uh, after it's hard. And after you paint it, nobody will ever see it's there. And it'll keep the freeze, plug, freeze plugs from popping out. If the freeze plugs on the right-hand side of the block pop out while you're driving, it's just a bugger to get those things back in because you just aren't, you cannot get the right relationship um, to, to do it. You have to have a really, really heavy hammer, three pound, five pound ball and an intermediate hammer. But sometimes it's easier to, to hang over the whole engine, hang over the, put something on top of the carburetors and the in the left left fender and actually put your body up so you're you're working over yourself and you're banging um, banging uh, uh, downwards. Um, those are just horrible to do. But the rear one, which looks like the most impossible one to do, is relatively easy to do. The rear one uh, on the MGB, it's a one and five eighths freeze plug. Okay, one and five eighths. You can buy that from Napa. So maybe the old one is just dislodged, just dislodged. So behind on an MGB, not an MGA, too bad, but on an MGB, there's the rear engine bearing plate that sits right behind the block. And that rear engine bearing plate has got a, a, a hole, a hole in it. So now you need like a three eighths bolt, two nuts and two big washers. So you put the bolt through. You put the you put the put a nut onto the onto the bolt. Put a big washer on. Put it through the plate. Put the washer on this side. Put the nut on this side, and tighten up that tighten up that bolt until it presses against the freeze plug and holds it in place. And then lock down the the, the two bolts. Looks horrible. You would never see it because it's way in the, on the end of the engine. But without that, you've got to take the whole engine out of the car. So three eighths, three eighths bolt, maybe by one and a half, maybe a couple of three eighths nuts, a couple of great big washers to fit in there, and that will do it. And that's what Greg Glasner used um, to get his rear freeze plug back into place when his popped out when he was driving up from Cleveland to come to our summer party. Hey, John. This is Jeff. Yeah. I don't yeah. know if you can see it in my picture. <laughs> That's funny. But uh, I, the machine shop put the Welsh plugs in mine, but they forgot to dimple the middle one. And two things. One, you're driving down the road, and the guy behind you says, I just saw the biggest cloud of steam I ever saw in my life. Uh, and you look at your temperature gauge, and instead of going to hot, it's going to cold because there's no water on the 
temperature pickup. But anyway, on the TD, that's on my TD, you drop the wing, you take the manifold off, you use a one inch solid steel rod and an eight pound sledge gently <laughs> and you and it and you dimple that thing in, it'll never come out. The um there are one, two, three, there are about five or six freeze plugs on that on that XPAG block. And and um all but one of them are, well, you can use a one and three eighths American plug, easy schmeasy, just easy. But that last one, they're, they're all originally, actually, they're all metric, but the one and three eighths works um, on all the small ones. But that big one, oh my gosh, there's no way. And the, the ones we used to buy from one of our major suppliers, they were so thin, I hated to use them. So I'd take a larger one solder a bolt to it, chuck it up in the lathe, turn it down to the right diameter. What a lot of fussing around. But yeah, that's, Judd, your picture there is a is a, a true indication of how much trouble it is to change the freeze plugs. That's why when you put them in, you surround them with JB Weld. Yeah. I don't know about for the A or the B. Uh, hopefully I'll never have to know. But Tom Lange sells very good quality uh, freeze plugs at a pretty reasonable price. Yep, yep. yep. So that yeah, that's uh, uh, Tom. Um, he he pronounces it German. Lange, L-A-N-G-E, um, L-A-N-G-E. Like you normally pronounce it Lang. And uh, he's at Half Moon Farm in Maine. So you can, you can find him. He's got a, a lot of good uh, T-type T-type parts. Yes, sir. So hey, John, about freeze yeah. plugs. Oh, Greg Glasser. Hey, there you yeah, are. Okay. I'm, I'm a guy. It's still in there, too. Hey, well, it'll be in there forever. It is. I'm going to paint it black. Um, but what I've done as far as the side ones, uh, the same, what's that, Dorman? Yes. Yeah, I bought I bought one of their copper plugs. Oh. Have you ever used those? I have not. One and five eighths. They slip in. You hold on them with a one wrench and you tighten the nut with the other and it expands the copper to fill the hole. Very nice. So I threw one in the back of the car. Just just in case. Yeah. You know, and and um I saw Barney here earlier. He when I talked to him at your place, first thing he asked me was, was your engine just rebuilt? I said, Yes. He says, Well, that's what happened. You know, they put new freeze plugs in and they didn't do one quite right. And uh, I did call the builder, and he's pretty upset about it. But it happens, you know. Yeah, it just, and, you know, that stuff just does happen. And I seem to remember. Did you show me your plug? Did I see your plug? That yeah. Was, and it had goo on the inside of it. It's like no. There it is. I still have it with me. Oh, right there. Okay. It's, it's got, there it's you got never, some... never put goo on the inside because when the when the goo gets hot, it expands and pushes the plug out. Yeah. Nope. That, and, and whoever hammered this in did it all off center. Yeah, so I didn't think I didn't think it was factory. You know, yeah. well, I found out uh, from uh, Dick who had the engine built that his machinist does replace freeze plugs. So, no, I'm, can, I add, can I add one comment to that? Yeah, Dave. Yeah, um, I did the the Dorman one and five eighths. You know, which is basically a copper domed uh, deal with a steel washer on it. You tighten it down. Uh, and the suggestion I got from Kent Prather was to uh, do the outer edge with Loctite green. Uh, it's Loctite Thread Locker Green 290. Blue, yeah. I thought he was a pretty good guy to get a suggestion <laughs> from. Yeah, uh, we had him on, oh my gosh, two years ago, I think. Um, Kent, and uh, he's he's built a lot of <clears throat> a lot of really, really good engines. He's a really good engine builder absolutely so well we we just came upon that uh and that jb weld it just it helped it just helps hold it in there and of course the lower the pressure you have on the on the on the radiator cap the the less problem you're going to have an open system like a td i mean it's real hard for those to fall out except for juds because uh, that, that isn't pressurized um in my mga i've had a leaking water pump for i think two or three years I don't even screw the the cap on tight, so the system doesn't even pressurize, so it doesn't doesn't leak. You know, as soon as I tighten it up, you know, like comes under seven or 
<laughs> well, you don't know what pressure the caps are because even though they're rated, um, they're, they're all over the place, just like thermostats stamped. You just you can't trust them. You have to check them be, before you stick them in. Anyway, anyway, Dave, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. So Wayne from the San Luis Obispo says GOF West is in Carlsbad, California, October 16 through 20. So yeah, I won't be there that weekend. That's too bad. That sounds that although I don't know. I don't know, maybe. Now I'm intrigued. Thank you. Thanks. Mark Vidalin. Hi, John. Marty, see, oh, the, the photos from the summer party are now up on the website. So that that's good stuff. Um, let's see, Mark, Mark uh, Vidalin, are, are all MGAs brought to North America originally using HS4s? No, H4s. I have H4s on the 56, but I think mine was exported from Germany before making its way to Canada. So all the MGAs, all the bug eye sprites, all have H type carburetors. So um, in the uh, as do the Z type magnets, the, the Farina magnets have got HD carburetors, um, horizontal diaphragm, and those are those are one and a half carburetors and they exist no other place, I guess, than other than on there. You got to get you get to eight inch and three quarters, two inch, two and an eighth. Um, then you you you've got uh, HD carburetors are on, on a lot of Heelys and, and the bigger cars, the 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 uh, Bentleys and Rolls Royces and all that expensive stuff. So but no I as far as I know all MGAs came with H H type carburetors. Let's see, Jordan, do the carbs put any back pressure on the fuel, just I'm trying to read this, uh, on the fuel line that would look like a decreased fuel flow in a clear filter? No, but you can get, sometimes, you know, people will say, oh, I, I looked in my fuel filter and, and there was no gasoline in the fuel filter, therefore the fuel pump is bad. No. Your fuel filter sometimes can look absolutely empty and it's still moving lots of fuel just because there's air trapped in it. So, um, Jordan K, are you still on? I am. Okay. So, um, is that is that what's going on? You, you look through the fuel filter and you, you see a big bubble in there or it doesn't appear to be any fuel? N no. I mean, I understand that the filter might not necessarily fill up, but if I turn it so that I can see the quantity of fuel coming in. It's a trickle. It's, it's, a tri it's just it a, trickle. a trickle. It is a trickle because you, you can't see it at 80 if I, miles an hour, you know, when, when it's really moving fuel. Okay. So that's kind of my question. So if I pull it off of the front of the filter and stick it in a jar, the jar fills up so quick. So I know the flow is there, but right. I would have thought that it would flow that rate it, it's, until um, it met a physical restriction of fuel, not just the air in the filter. There's um, there's no better explanation than 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 to compare the flow bowl to the back of your to, to the back of your toilet. And if you take that line off the back of your toilet, it'll fill up a gallon jug real fast, real fast, you know. But but the the the, the amount of water going into the tank in the back of the toilet. Is is a function of how far open the valve is when the when, when the valve is is moving. And at idle, your engine uses hardly any fuel at all, and and uh, it only trickles in there as it has to. So that's why you, you see such a small amount moving through the filter. Okay, I I've been trying to hunt down a a stumble that I get when I run sustained RPMs. Okay. For a length of time, and I didn't know if maybe what, what my year? fuel supply was not enough. No. It's a seventy-two. Uh, seventy-two MGB. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So, um, first of all, look for the timing. And again, as I told the, the gentleman from Paris, um, that all MGs, nineteen forty-five through nineteen eighty, yep. vacuum disconnected, thirty-two degrees, full mechanical advance, right. 
you check that on yours just to see because boy, that can make all the difference in the world um, on how it is. Because if the timing's too retarded, you can get you can you it'll spit sometimes going up a real slight incline because it's too lean. It'll feel like you're running into a headwind or you're pulling a trailer. Just it just uh, it just not it won't it just doesn't go, you know. And it's because it's too retarded. So check the timing. Go back to the timing. All right. Okie doke. Mr. Neary wants to know what the resistance is supposed to be on a temperature sensor at room temperature. And I want to say that it is about 80 ohms. Um, I think, or is that is, is that the the temp the temp sensor? Mr. Neary, are you still on? Well, I've got I'm, I'm gonna hit mute all because I've got some background noise of someone's wife talking to her girlfriend. Um, and uh, but Mr. Neary, are you still on? Because we're talking about the temp sensor, a GTR 101 or a GTR 103, or unless you're talking about a Midget 1500, and that's a GTR 109, General Thermostatic Resistor. It's a unipart number that I remember. Um, anyway, um, at room temperature, it, it should read up on the gauge as cold. Um, so that, that's probably, um, it, it probably reads, it probably reads, I'm trying to remember, um, the resistance probably decreases the hotter it gets, so the so the the meter reads higher on the on the gauge. But somehow I just think that's backwards. But anyways, it's about twenty to eighty. It's around there, around twenty to eighty ohms. Okay, Brian, does anyone have a solution for a hard choke pull on HIF carburetors? Yes, I do. But are you on, Brian? Are you still there? You want to talk about the choke cable? Even though Brian is not answering, here is a I am. oh, here you are. Okay, Brian, come on. I didn't find the right spot. But there, there we go. All right. So here is. I want to know too. <laughs> okay. So anyway, when you buy a new choke cable, I'm gonna. Let me get rid of my background here because when you get your choke cable here and you get a new one, um, a new cable, first of all, it's supplied with a nut up here that's about a millimeter wide. I mean, it is so friggin' tiny that you can't hold anything with it. So go to the hardware store and buy, I think it's a 7 16th 20. Uh, a nut that will fit on there, a great big wide nut, and then you can reach it with a wrench up, up underneath the dash. So once you get the outer sheath in, or even if the outer sheath is already in, and you want to make your cable, geez, you want to make your cable um, work correctly. There we go. So you pull the cable out of the sheath, easy for me to say, that isn't going to work here because it's jammed in the sheath somehow. I don't know where it's jammed. Anyway, I'll just talk about it. Take the, take the cable um, and uh, withdraw it. Um, you, have, you, you may have to tin the end of it with, with your soldering, soldering iron and then snip it off so it isn't splayed. So you can put it back down through. Anyway, after you pull it out, squirt some oil down inside the inside some sheath, the sheath, and then Put grease on the cable as you feed the cable down, down, down in there, and and uh, so that the cable itself let me get this out of the way. So the cable itself moves nice and easily. I mean, you grab a hold of the cable and it, it just moves. Then, where your interconnecting link comes up against the H HIF carburetors, um, that that shaft that goes between the um, between one carburetor and, and the other. This one has got, has got an end float. 
It has to it has to move back and forth. If it's jammed, the choke will be on and so forth. Make sure that both these guys are are lubricated really well, and it should it should with all of that move really easily. The longer a cable is, the harder it is to pull. This is really really a, a problem with T types and MGAs where the cable abutment isn't built into the cable like it is on an eight, like on a, like the later model MGBs. This uh, abutment is is built built in, and with uh, with with the MG MGB carburetors, of course, the inner cable is fixed, and it's the outer sheath that moves. Um, yeah. So yeah. you got it hooked up like that correctly. Yeah, I've got, got uh, I, uh, I've, the cable itself is all lube, seven ways sunny moves just great, but I need two fingers to pull that, uh, the T, T handle out of the dash. Once I get it out, locks fine, everything works just like it's supposed to. It's such a hard pull. So, yes. so John, I thought I had the problem with my car too, and I found a solution. The, the angle in which the lever on the carburetor is set, mine was straight up and down. So when I pulled on it, I was pulling hard on it. I angled a little bit and then it worked smooth. Right. So so when you're when you're pulling through that through that motion, you're starting at 45 degrees down and pulling up. Because if you start here, you can only pull it up so, so far. So you always start at 45 degrees down. So you've got a nice a nice sweep like that. And what was the other thing I was, oh, and then the other thing is that this little hole down here looks like it's supposed to take a spring. It doesn't take a spring. If you put a spring between here and the heat shield on both carburetors, oh my gosh, it's impossible to pull. So get rid of those extra, you only have one spring on the choke cable and it goes on a little tiny, a little tiny device that's right next to the cable abutment. So all that yeah. does is pull the pull the cable off. So in, that spring that spring should come off. It doesn't really play much uh, of a of a use, does it? Um, the reason the reason the springs there on the cable is just to make sure the cable's pulled off. And when you do put the cable in, um, when I put the cable in, I I never push it all the way in the dash. I always leave the cable like standing proud about like that so when it's off it's still standing proud from the dash just leave a little yeah. bit of free play so when you push it back in you're sure that it's it is in fact all the way in if you've got a problem with that you, you want to um if you want to uh facetime me tomorrow on on an iphone or take some pictures of it and send them to me on my phone i'll i'll be happy to talk to you about it take a look at it because it should work i mean it should work real easily yeah, John, there's, can there's I propose another here. solution? I'll, uh, I'll get into it. The more it's supposed to rain here anyway. So, <laughs> okay. Fred, Fred came in. I recognize his voice. Oh, this is Steve. Oh, Steve. I have right. a 1980, and I put SUs on it. So I don't know if this car had originally had a, a choke cable, but I replaced it because the ends got frayed or whatever reason it was. Okay. And it, was they had all those problems i couldn't pull on it i'm you know really perplexed about this and i even ordered another one and what i did was when i put it in i kind of routed it over some wires in a manner that created a, a binding angle under the dashboard and when i moved it, it works like a charm so the, the way it's supposed to be routed on the on an earlier car is of course it, on the on the on uh, to the right of the steering wheel, and, a, and it comes down and goes through the firewall right next to the clutch, uh, right next to the brake pedal. Goes right right through there and then comes up underneath, comes up underneath, and and uh, and works the works the linkage from the underside. Yeah, what I, what I did was I there was just some wires together and they were bound together underneath. Yeah, it. and I just. I, I don't remember if I routed a, above or below that bundle of wires, but it made all the difference. I, I believe that. I believe that because it's the outer the outer cable that, that ends up moving. So on a on a 75, well, 75 and 76, 
you can pry the little plug out of the dash and put the choke back in there where it originally was. Um, or 77 through 80, you take the rheostat out of the dash, which is over on the left-hand side, the left-hand side of the wheel, and move the rheostat to a blanking plug right above it, or else just get rid of the rheostat altogether. Most of them don't work anyway. Who needs dim on your on your lights on your dash? And then and then it's a steel back, and you can put the choke cable through there. It's just perfect. It's steel backed. It's great. It's it's uh, it's out of the way of the steering wheel. It can be pulled out. And you can still steer the steer the wheel without without hitting it with, with your fingers. So those are some other hints. I don't know. Thanks, note on that for you, John. This is well, Barney. Hey, hey Barney. Uh, you know, the longer the cable is, the more resistance it's going to have. Right. The more bends you put in it, the more resistance it's going to have. As a general rule, reduce the number of bends, reduce the radius. You'd like to have no more than two 90 degree bends at eight inch radius. You get more bends or tighter radiuses, it's going to drag a lot. Exactly. And I, I know, I, this, especially that thing about the length, because when you buy a new choke cable, say for a TD, it, it's, I don't know, it's six foot long. It isn't that long, but it's way too long. So you put the thing in and it's all sort of coiled up and everything and you go to pull it, 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 it you can't, you can't. You can't put a pair of ice grips on it and you can't pull it. Um, so you get it as short as you can. But the ones that already have the abutment on the end, you're, you're stuck with a length. And that what, what Barney says here is absolutely correct. And that is you want nice, uh, nice soft radiuses um, moving, that, moving that cable in, into position. So those those are all hints. Thanks, Tom. Hey, okay. All right. Now here we got uh Bradley, Bradley Schwartz. My car was difficult to start because the fuel was three sixteenths too low in both float bolts. The float forks had not been adjusted properly for new needles and seats. Well, not only was it hard to start, it wasn't it couldn't run right either. Um, the the uh, the adjustment that you make on the bottom of the carburetor is is essential for idle, is essential for idle. But up at speed, the position of the jet isn't quite as critical, um, and it has to do with the amount of uh, amount of where the where the gasoline sits in the float bowl. So yeah, if you've got if you've got uh, wrong wrong mixture. Um, that'll that'll show up more at higher speed, but then you 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 don't know it unless it's way too lean. And then oh, somebody else was talking about their car surging and everything, but almost always that's a that's a problem with with um, timing. But yeah, your float height is critical. Critical. Phil Calura, my seventy four. Uh, here we go. Here's one completely out, out this is good my 74 mgb backup lights come on when i energize the ignition working under the tar i can extinguish them by disconnecting two different green wires from the transmission i have overdrive the wiring diagrams i have don't seem to match the car okay well phil you can send me a note are you on phil are you still on have you waited all this time for your 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 answer Maybe Phil has, but um, anyone who wants a wiring diagram, I can send them the wiring di diagram for your car because unless you've got a factory workshop manual, you got a Haynes manual or something, it, it, it bunches the wiring diagrams and they're not always correct. But the, the most common problem with the backup lights being on all the time is simply that the switch is jammed on. And to, do, to re repair it, correct it, all you need to do is buy a new reverse switch, undo the switch. It's located immediately above the cross member on the right-hand side of the gearbox, um, uh, right next to the right next to the passenger's left knee. And you just reach up in there, crack it. It's a real coarse thread, uh, four, 14 by 2.0, I think. And and um, that the switch just unscrews. You put another screw in, you put another switch in, test it, because sometimes the the uh, the switch will come on on and off when you don't want it to. Sometimes you need shims in there to properly position it. So 
That's e that was easy. Let's see, Gary, what is the cause of a short run on when you shut the engine off on a 66 MGB? It's called dieseling and it's caused by having fuel and, and heat for combustion. So there's no way to get rid of the fuel. The fuel comes through, you just can't do that. In 1973, there's an anti-run-on valve circuit installed into all the MGs. So when you turn the key off, the car stops dead. Oh my gosh, it just stops. Prior to that, they will, they do, they can and they will diesel. So the only thing you can do to slow it down, slow the dieseling down, is, is sit for just a moment before you shut it off. That's one way. The lower your idle is, the less dieseling it might have. The higher octane gasoline you run, the less dieseling it might have. After that, the cylinder head has to come off and you got to take the carbon out, whatever carbon there is, and take any hot spots off the edge of the edge of the combustion chamber. That's really expensive. Or you can do what I do in my 1962 MGA, and that is turn the key off and you listen because I've, I've got it timed. And when it comes just to where it's just about ready to quit and start dieseling, you dump the clutch in second gear. Oh, isn't that horrible for the clutch? Yeah, but what's worse? A little bit of wear on the clutch of the engine jerking around and bump up a bump up a bump for 15 or 20 seconds. I'd say that engine hopping around, run backwards and stuff is, is, is a worse deal. So I clutch mine, but those are other things that you can do. John? Yes. Yeah, I have a question. I come back on the other, um, other drive uh, gear, uh, gearbox. My uh, MG is a Californian MGB with a, a US engine, I would say, and a Stromberg uh, ca carburetor, Zenit Stromberg. What year? What year is it? Uh, 77. OK. I change everything with an engine and a gearbox coming from an, an, an English MG GT from 74. And uh, I change, uh, so I kept the gearbox, the English gearbox, because uh, she, uh, it has uh, another drive. The question concerns the, the, the wiring to go from the gearbox to the switch on the dashboard I have to install because before I had no, no other drive and which diagram I have to use, the, the 77 US diagram or the 74 GB diagram. So when you're, when you're wiring this up, um, you've got, you, you've had to add an extra switch, correct? Yes, I have it. And so you want to put a 10 amp fuse in that circuit. Okay. The original, the original overdrive circuits are not fused. So I don't know where you're drawing your power from, but um, but you just just make sure that you've got a 10 amp fuse in that in that circuit. That wire goes from the switch to the lockout switch on the top of the gearbox. It's the least accessible electrical component in the vehicle. You can't reach it from, unless you drop the, the back end of the, of the engine. But the wire goes to the switch, uh, from your overdrive switch on your dash, it goes to the switch on the gearbox, and from the switch on the gearbox to the solenoid. If you send me uh, your email address, send me an email, and I'll sketch, yep. I'll diagram it for you with the colors and 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 locations. Okay, and 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 and, and to reach uh, the the switch on the gearbox at the, at, at the back of the uh, gearbox, one, if one. if you do a hole in the tunnel, is it is is it uh, is it fine or or you have to go under the car to 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 go to the switch? Got to go under the car to go to the switch. Okay. You, you, um, it's it's a real it's a real hassle reaching that switch. Very, <laughs> very difficult. 
Okay, thank you. I send you. A, I, I will send you a message. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So here we've got uh, Brad Schwartz. So we're 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 at nine oh five. So we're we're starting to run. We're starting to run a little late here tonight. We'll answer a couple more questions. I don't know how many more questions there are here, but we'll see if we can get through to a couple more here. So Bradley Schwartz, if you're still on, you can come on. When adjusting the jet height to set the mixture, the workshop says the carburetor not being set should be taken out of action by lifting the piston half an inch and closing the throttle plate. No, no, I, I take great issue with that. No, no. Not you, necessary? No, no, you can't. It doesn't work. No, you, you you just you do one carburetor at a time. You work this one, and then you work this one, and then and then you come back and check it and check it. Yep, you don't you don't lift the air piston. You don't you don't close throttle. Okay, so you, you don't agree with that then? No, not at all. Not necessary. Okay. Advice. That's I know it's the factory workshop manual, but that's just bad advice. What? Okay. What year are you working? It's not. What it what it's a 1960 MGA. Yeah, I don't know who wrote that stuff up in that section D of fuel. Um, I, yes. I I don't even I because people have said, well, the workshop manual says this. You can't you can't tune it like that. It just doesn't. It I I don't I don't know who what they were thinking. I, I guess the idea was you're only running on one carburetor. If you if you but it <laughs> disable it. Yeah, if you disable it, but but then not you're running the whole car on one carburetor, and you're not. You're running half the car on one carburetor, so that's where you want to tune it. I mean, it just it, n okay. none of it. It's e not easier not to do it. It's Thank you. Easier not to do it. The uh, the uh, original MGA workshop manual also had um, the thrust washers on the on the center main cap. They've got flutes in them uh, to to let the oil hit the hit the surface that's hitting the the uh, bearings in in the original workshop manual, they had you put the those uh, uh, thrust washers in backwards. They corrected it, but they don't get everything right. Mr. Uh, Michael Cunningham with a seventy five midget, are you on? I'm on. Okay, seventy five midget fifteen hundred. I started hearing a slight grinding noise. When pressing the clutch, I looked underneath and found that the pivot pin had dropped halfway out. Pushing it back up fixed the problem, but it won't fix it forever because it's just going to drop back out again. So get a 5 16 bolt that's about five inches long, and you reach reach up in there and, and, and find the hole at the top and drop that down through. And the, because the bolt has a head on it, it'll never fall out. It'll never jump back out. So, so okay. follow the pin that you've got right now with that with a long five sixteenth. I it's like a five inch. Just go to the hardware store and buy some some cheapy, uh, you know, like grade five bolt and drop it through there. That we used to do that at the shop. Just a real quick. Okay. It'll last you forever. All right. Thank you. Okay. Don Nelson, how can you tell if each carb damper has enough oil in it? Um, just fill it up. If you get any question, I'll just just fill it, and the excess will just piss out. Um, but again, you never have to put more oil in an SU. Strombergs, we'll talk about those another time. You got to fill those up all the time. So, um, yeah, okay. Well, the uh, so Seth says. I found that if I put too much oil in my dash pots, um, it puts a nice sheen on the on the insulation on the underside of the bonnet. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, because when you rev it up, that extra oil just squirts right out of there. So iPhone to everybody who's ever who has ever iPhone. John, I'm considering buying a 72B that is supercharged. In uh, it's in Denver. Uh, once I personally check it out, I'm having it shipped to Florida. I'm concerned that the 5,000 foot elevation might 
cause some running issues. It most certainly will. And it's not five, th five yeah, it's Mile High City, isn't it? Yeah. So anyway, um, you want to talk to sports car craftsmen in Arvada, Denver, Colorado. Ian, talk to Ian or, or Paul. It's sports car craftsmen. They probably, they're the ones who probably put the blower on it in the first place. And then once you get it to Florida, talk to Glenn at Glenn's MG service in Tampa. And uh, Glenn's got the, he, the, these guys, the, I, they're still in the trade. They both, both uh, Paul and Ian and, and, or all three of them, Paul and Ian and Glenn at Glenn's MG service are in the business every single day. And they know exactly what to do for their environments. And if you're not around, um, if you're not around St. Pete, Tampa, um, uh, at least at least talk to Glenn. But there's probably probably a different needle to use, or at least you've got to enrich the 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 mixture. And Richard Pittenger, yes, I will I will talk about the um, I'll talk about the Zena Stromberg carburetor in the next Zoom since I've spent this amount of time talking about SUs. So here's the uh, here's the SU document. I see that as uh, Fred's put that on for us, and that's uh, um, that's helpful. I can't stop the uh, the leak from the block where the petcock is. Can I just seal it with a bolt or with JB Weld? iPad has asked this. It's so crude, but absolutely because you, nobody ever drains their block. Uh, I don't know what kind of en engine it is, but you can buy a new pet cock. You can take the old pet cock out. You can take it apart. You can use some valve winding compound on it or some polishing compound and clean up, clean up the flute on it or clean up the taper on it and do a real nice job and it won't leak. Um, but in the end, um, you can just put something down inside the valve and put the valve back in because you're never, ever going to want to drain that uh that block what what year is your car it's a 1958 but it has a three main eight hanging under in it yeah okay well, and, those... uh, I, I bought the new petcock for it, put it in with the washer and everything um and it looks like there's a little bit of brass shavings put the uv stuff in so that's where i know it was coming from and after just 10 or 15 miles i was at least on a uh about a quart of water it wasn't a big deal because it was just going into town, but bought the new petcock, put it, you know, put the Teflon tape on it, put it in. It's not leaking nearly as bad, but I'm still losing water. Okay. So if you're losing water, that's, that's an issue. Um, but if it's, you, you can see if it's dripping out, out of the petcock, is it coming out of the water pump? That's the most common place. It's, no, it's not. And, it's it's and coming you, out of that petcock. Then the other thing is that you, think it's losing water but it isn't it's just stabilizing so you know the top of the radiator tank is what about that tall right and correct really the water when you fill it up if you fill it up all the way and then get it hot and turn it off that water gets so hot and and, and a pint of it dumps out on the ground uh -huh. and lose all that antifreeze on there and you can keep filling it up every time it's cold and it'll keep pissing it out every time it's hot so wait for it to stabilize, and and because um, it isn't full, the radiator is not full to the top. Of course, you've got to have room for expansion. So, but it's either leak, leaking out the leaking out the water pump, it's leaking out the overflow on the on the radiator, and you're just not used to it yet. If you've got any kind of white smoke out of the back of the car, it's not smoke; it's steam, um, and you can be you can be losing some some um, water through a head gasket or a cracked head, you can find that out by running the car hard, getting it hot, taking all four spark plugs out. If you get steam out of one of the spark plug holes, oops, <laughs> oops, there's more work to do. So. No, the, it's, it's a, a, a freshly rebuilt motor. And once I put the other, the new pet cock in, um, I put the little UV stuff in it and I can actually see just a small little puddle. So it is coming out of that area on the block. And I was just thinking just, when I took the original one out, it was clogged. So I had bought a new one. And uh, so it is still, you know, at nighttime with the little UV flashlight, I can actually see it. And it was moist under there. So I'm I pretty so, sure that's it. I so hate to push JB Weld into a hole 
like like that. You can. It is. It's a quarter inch BSP fitting, so it's not just an American plug. It's okay. Quarter inch BSP, and uh, if you call out to uh, oh someone who's got used parts, sports car craftsman, and tell them what what you're doing. Um, they can they they can they can sell you a plug that goes in there because the later MGB um, they saved the money they didn't they didn't put a pet dock they they just put a a, a bolt there um, so there's this quarter inch BSP and if you talk to Ian at Sports Car Craftsman in Denver he'll 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 get you the the, the right thing or you could unscrew it and put a plug of, put grease in behind it just. Pull that, fill that whole thing full of grease. And chances are the pressure that's in there ain't going to blow the grease out. So. Okay, great, great. Thank you. Okay. Chad Bergeson, sure appreciate these and all your uh, YouTube videos. Um, yep. People are saying that they have to drop away. But it is it is nine sixteen, so I am down to about um, Gil Dupre. Has anyone put a Rostra Universal Cruise Control on an MGB? Well, I know Gene Cooper put some kind of cruise control on, but that was about thirty or forty years ago when you actually bought them. You could buy them, but I I don't know uh, I don't know specifically. I do know that you've got you've got you got a vacuum canister on a on a cruise control. And it, to make it look nice, you can either put it over by where the charcoal canister is or, or where it, it is in, on the later cars. And I've also seen one down uh, to the front right of the, of the um, radiator, way, way, way out in front. Just, and it just disappeared. I, I didn't even see that it was there until I, I looked and saw that little dangly thing on the, on the uh interconnecting linkage on the on the carburetors so hey john i put a an audio box on when they were only a hundred dollars now they're up to about three but it works just like a factory cruise you put the clutch in it shuts off it, and all of that and but i had to buy a vacuum canister and like you said i put it back where the where that on the shelf there and uh, it works great when, when my right leg turned 50 it got tired so I put a cruise <laughs> and uh, yeah, it just, it works. And it, the thing about the audio box, you can use the pickup from the drive shaft and I, you want to put it on the yoke or you could hook it up to the um, coil. I did both because you, okay. you just snip them. And uh, it, I have not lost those little magnets that they're held on with wire, but uh, I still use the, uh, the coil and it, it just, it works great. I, I, I love having it. You can't buy the vacuum ones anymore. Yes, well, the, well, the, the new one is all electronic. The uh, audio box you can get uh, on eBay, but people want an arm and a leg for them, and they're probably used. Oh yeah, Gil. I I don't. Uh, that's it. Uh, the only person I I know who's who's got this. Uh, so that that Rostra Universal Control is all all digital now. Yeah. So can you hook that up to an ignition coil? Does it even work? Well, you, you have to put a magnet on your drive shaft. Oh, okay. All right. Pick up on your drive shaft. Or you can get a, you can have a GPS uh, speedometer. You can get a VSS, VSS signal out of it. Okay. But you, you know, it uses the VSS signal. <clears throat> or you can buy... Uh, they make a generator, a signal generator that goes on the general motor's transmission, but it just square in place with the cable. But I don't know what it was that would fit an MGB. And I'm, I'm using a magnet. So I had the vacuum units on the MGA and my MGB, and both of them failed after so long a time. Okay. And uh, I couldn't get them fixed. And, and you, can't, you can't buy a new one anymore. eBay's got a bunch of used Okay. And the, the roster cost, you know, it's still expensive, but I, I like I like the cruise control, so I'm putting them putting 
put one on. We've got people in the club that's got them on CDs, uh, TFs, or digits, or oh. everything else. MG, MGB is hard to get enough clearance on your drive shaft because the tunnel is so tight. Okay. I'm putting it on the yoke to see how it's uh, actually the shaft. And, uh, it's in front of the uh, universal joint set of my hand. So, see how that works. Yeah. Well, let us know next next time how how, how you come out on that. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to take some pictures of it, maybe put it in the magazine. Okay. Well, we're all we're all done here. It's it's the nine twenty, and and we've gone through the whole chat section. I want to thank those who are still hanging on to to uh, um thank you for hanging on so long. Oh my gosh, I what we must have got up to two hundred and fifteen. I glanced at it at one point at the at the uh, numbers, and uh, Marty probably is is uh, has a clue. Oh, John, yeah. hi, this is John from Michigan. Uh, yeah. Two seven. Two hundred and seventeen. Two hundred and seventeen. That's right. Thank you. I didn't know you were. counts is always a little higher than mine. I had two thirteen. <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll take I'll take the big one. Okay. So. <laughs> nice hat. John, with the picture of you standing there in your Boy Scout uniform with a pith helmet. Very nice. Oh, that, and the that's, screen uh, that's uh, that was at the uh, mint julep party, and uh, <laughs> croquet and, and uh, the cro long croquet and mint julep party in 1980, just after I got got the uh, car um, restored. Yeah, when I when I was thinner, so, uh, and I I'm not sure I pulled that that specific pith helmet out yet, but I have that in the other room. <laughs> so. Good to see you yesterday. Thank you for coming to the uh, British Car Festival. Over I think it were over 450 cars. Oh, that was such a beautiful day, and there was such a wide variety of of three wheel Morgans, and of course all the MGs, MG Y. There's a Y uh, Y type there, and and uh, Dino's RV8, and all the MGs, but there were t Triumphs and and I, everything. I did, I'm not sure I saw a Bond, but I didn't I didn't look at much of the other sections. So anyway, yeah, 28 Lotus, 22. Austin Healy, uh, um, mostly vintage, probably 75% vintage, 25% modern, but there were several British motorcycles too. Very nice. Um, uh, so thanks for coming to that. Hey, it, was, it was fun. Nice to see you there. Gosh. So, all right. Well, everybody, thank you very, very kindly. And our next, our next gathering will be um, on the 25th, Monday the 25th. Um, today is 9-11, Patriots Day. I had my flags flying out today. So in memory of those who, who uh, innocent. I mean, more people died in the Twin Towers than at Pearl Harbor. Um, and they were all non-combatants. Unless you count some of the policemen there, I suppose, who died as combatants. But that's not really fair. Anyway, thank you all for being here. And uh, we'll... Uh, slowly fade out here thanks john we'll let you thank know you john it. thanks thank a lot you, john, john. Thanks, john. Thanks, john. always good thank, thank you, you very much well, that was so that was so sweet miracle on 28th street i love it <laughs> <laughs> thanks john I'm glad you like that hey Bradley, thank, thank you, you. okay thanks john. thanks john thanks thanks everybody for being here and good night, john. Uh, and good night. Barney, nice to see you tonight. Good night, you know, John. Gloria, Bob, glad it was as easy as a half shaft and not a not a whole friggin' oh Jim Pastor. Here we go. How are you doing? Good. You have to show your caricature sometime to everyone. Oh, yeah, well here, here. I got, I got it here. Oh, oh, this is this is uh whoops. Um yeah, here, just a second. Let me get the view changed. Just a sec. I'll be right back. <laughs>
So it's the 29th annual British Central British Car Fest, Shim Pastor. Uh, always got something going on and uh, tries to make it new and exciting. The past couple of years, we, on Saturday, when there's been axe throwing instead of Jim Connors. Anyway, this time he had a caricaturist. And oh, you can't see it because of the background. Just a minute, let me get rid of my. I got to work better on more on my background shoes none there we go so here's the here's the caricature you know that that the that the guy did to me right just reminds me i gotta lose some weight but um anyway it's real nice caught the, caught the caught the wire rim glasses and everything so jim thank you very much for getting looks that good thanks john all right good night good night, good night. Good night.